Hey guys, when I was making the last episode about the NEC Multisync 3D, it occurred to me that over the years, I've made a lot of custom video cables. So I thought today would be a good opportunity to take a look at that process. Here are a bunch of custom cables that I've made over the years. And the reason you may need to build something of your own is to adapt one manufacturer's proprietary video connector for another type of display. Things weren't all that standard back in the 80s and every vendor used either a different type of cable or pinout, even if the signaling itself was the same. For example, here we've got an Amiga's 23 pin video connector going to a standard nine pin connector. Similarly, we've got a nine pin connector going to an HD 15 connector here. If you've got a SCART enabled display, you may need to connect a VGA style output to a SCART or maybe you've got an Apple II GS with its 15 pin connector that you wanna to connect to a SCART display. Here we have an IDC connector using ribbon cable and this is for a joystick tester. Over here, this is an EIAJ8 RGB cable used on the Sears total video system. And maybe we shouldn't talk about this one at all. The first connector we'll look at is the screw terminal. And these are pretty self-explanatory. You just connect the wire to the numbered block that you want and away you go. They work great and they're really good for prototyping, but they are a bit bulky compared to the other types of connectors we'll look at in a moment. Next, we've got the IDC connector or insulation displacement contact. And it's a crimp style connector that has little teeth that penetrate the shielding of the ribbon cable and make contact with the wire inside. They're really easy to make and pretty durable. So it's a great option for cables that are going to be inside of a machine. Next up, we have the ubiquitous solder terminal, and these come in every size and shape imaginable. Now, they take a little bit of practice to get right, but they result in a strong, permanent cable, and I will demonstrate making one of these in a little bit. The final connector we'll look at is called the Molex crimp terminal. These connectors have holes in them into which you insert crimped wires that have either male or female terminals on the ends. Now, they're not my favorite, but they are solder free and they do allow you to pop pins in and out easily and switch them around if necessary. In order to make a custom video cable, we'll first need to find the pinouts for the two devices we want to connect. How about we try and hook up an Apple II GS to an Amiga monitor? For this example, I've searched for the terms Apple II GS AV pinout. The system has a 15 pin D sub connector that carries video, audio, and power. We're only interested in the analog RGB signals, red, green, blue, ground, and composite sync. Having found the data, I'll record the pin numbers and their functions so we can create a wiring reference. While our focus today is on RGB, the same process applies to other types of cables as well, regardless of whether they carry audio, video, or data. Next, the other half of the equation, the Commodore 1084P's six pin DIN input. As we just saw, the Apple outputs a composite sync signal, but we can see that the 1084 is expecting separate horizontal and vertical sync instead. This could be an issue, let me come back to it in a sec. Now we can add the monitor's DIN 6 input to our table. We want to cross connect red to red, green to green, and blue to blue. The Apple provides multiple grounds, but we can tie them together to the monitor's single ground pin. RGB video can use different types of sync signals, including combined, separate HV, and sync on green. Your display must be able to support the type of sync generated by your computer or game console. Some monitors can handle multiple types of sync, including our 1084 here. While it normally expects separate horizontal and vertical signals, it can also decode the Apple's combined sync by wiring up the C-Sync signal to the H-Sync pin as I've done here. Check your owner's or service manual if you're not sure what your display can support. One last consideration. Different devices use different voltage levels for sync. You can damage your monitor if you feed it a five volt sync signal when it's only designed to accept one volt. You can often work around this simply by adding a resistor to your cable. Again, check the specs in your manual and also have a look at RetroRGB's website for the RGB specifications of many popular game consoles. Now that we have our wiring reference, we'll need to identify which pin is which on the connectors. Often, D-sub connectors will have the pin numbers embossed in the plastic housing. 
It's a bit hard to see without a zoom lens, but here they are from pin 1 to 9. The numbers are even more difficult to read on the solder side, but pins 1, 5, 6, and 9 are labeled. Some form of magnification will help out here. Even this Belkin KVM extension cable that I cut up for parts has the pin numbers present on the connector. Same goes for this SCART connector. If you're unsure which pin is which, refer to the D-sub cheat sheet. A link is in the description. The diagram shows the front face, or connection side, of both male and female parts. It's important to remember that the wiring side of your connector will be a mirror image of the front face that is shown in the cheat sheet. An easy trick to remember is that the wiring side of a male connector has the same pin configuration as the face side of a female connector, and vice versa. DIN connectors are slightly more complicated due to a variety of center pin configurations. This guide from Wikipedia shows the face of a female connector, which, as we just learned, is the same as the wiring side of the male connector. Some pinouts you find will be from the perspective of the device itself. Don't worry about trying to visualize how the face of the connector mirrors the machine or how the wiring side flips it back around again. Using the system as reference may disorient you when you're soldering the connector upside down or rotated. Pin 5 will always be pin 5, regardless of what perspective the diagram uses. So use the embossed numbers on the connector itself or the cheat sheet and you won't go wrong. Let's check out a different type of video cable. The NEC Multisync 3D is a VGA monitor that we looked at in the last episode. VGA uses analog RGB. The monitor also supports CGA and EGA, which both use digital RGB instead, but that requires an adapter that didn't come with the display. Here's the pinout chart for the adapter. It's specific to this multisync, based on how it expects the digital RGB signal to be delivered to what is normally an analog VGA connector. CGA uses red, green, blue, and intensity pins, four bits, to represent a maximum of 16 different colors. EGA uses red, green, blue, and a separate intensity pin for each, 6 bits, to represent 64 different colors. Pin 6 is repurposed depending on which video mode is being used. Now before we build this cable, let's see what parts and tools are needed for the job. First off, you're going to need to source the appropriate connectors for both ends of your cable. Now these are all readily available online, and here we have a variety of D-sub connectors, a SCART connector, and a DIN connector. All of these are commonly used in RGB cables. Of course, if you're going to use custom connectors on both ends, you're going to need a piece of wire, and I keep offcuts from old projects lying around for just this purpose. Another option is to purchase a pigtail from an online vendor such as this one that I got at DigiKey. On one end is a professionally built DIN connector, on the other end is a pre-tinned set of wires just ready to be connected to anything else that you want. Another option is just to cut one end off of an existing wire that you no longer need and put something else on in its place. A good source for cheap donor parts is your local thrift store. For one dollar, you should be able to find plenty of commonly used computer cables, and sometimes uncommon ones as well. Alright, let's take a look at some of the tools that you're going to need, depending on the type of cable that you want to make. First up, we have wire cutters and wire strippers. Pretty self-explanatory, but get yourself a set of good quality tools if you want to save yourself frustration later on. If you're going to be using solder terminals, then of course you're going to need a soldering iron and solder. As before, the same thing applies. A quality tool will make the job much easier. A screwdriver for the strain relief and housing of your connector. A PCB holder and a set of helping hands makes keeping everything in place much easier so you can focus on your soldering. Also, a set of tweezers makes holding the wires in place much easier so you don't burn yourself. A digital multimeter with continuity test is essential to figure out which wire connects to which pin in your cable as well as to validate that you've hooked everything up correctly in your finished product. 
If you're going to be using Molex connectors, you'll need the appropriate crimping tool. You'll also need the pin removal and installation tool, but I broke mine in a previous episode and I totally forgot to order a new one. Now I should mention that there are many other types of connectors out there and there's just no way to look at all of them. So we're only looking at the things that I've used for RGB cables today. So things such as coax and RJ45 are simply out of scope for today's video. IDC is a good choice when making simple, straight-through cables such as this Commodore Diagnostic Harness. On this pin header style connector, we can identify pin 1 by locating the arrow embossed in the plastic. Choose a wire to represent pin 1, I picked blue, and cut your ribbon cable to length. Aligning the blue wire to pin 1, insert the ribbon cable into the connector. You can go from either the top or the bottom. After we crimp it, we'll fold the ribbon cable over for strain relief, so make sure you're happy with the orientation before it becomes permanent. Using what we've just learned, locate pin 1 on the D-sub connector and make sure the blue wire goes to that side of the IDC terminal as well. To crimp the connector, you could use the special IDC tool, but I found that a bench vise also works great. In this example, I'm going from a 10-pin to a 9-pin connector, so I've separated out the unused wire. Apply only as much force as needed to close up the connector. Too much and you could easily crush the whole thing. IDC is quick and easy when making straight through cables like this. Custom wiring is also possible, but it's more difficult. Once the crimp is complete, fold the wire back over itself and install the strain relief. That's really all there is to it. Easy! And here's the diagnostic harness in action. These IDC cables are easy to roll up and store away when not in use. Molex terminals are a different type of crimped connector that are good for making custom cables. They require no soldering, so they can be made anywhere, but you'll still need to strip your wires first. A special tool is required to crimp a male or female pin to the wire. I have a cheap one that hardly works at all. The terminal falls out constantly and I can't get it to crimp the wire and its insulation at the same time. As a workaround, I'll position the terminal in the tool, insert the stripped wire, then crimp only the outer part around the insulation jacket first. Now, the terminal can't separate from the wire when I insert it into the tool and crimp the inner part around the exposed copper. This is a half measure that wouldn't be necessary with a better tool. Consider this my warning to you when shopping for a crimper. Once all your crimps are completed, you can insert the pins into the corresponding holes of your connector and use the special installation tool to lock them into place. This cable adapts the Amiga's 23-pin AV port for use with a standard 9-pin CGA monitor. If you make a mistake and need to rearrange your pin configuration, the other end of the installation tool can be used to release the terminal from the connector. When assembled correctly, Molex terminals can provide higher durability and electrical conductivity when compared to IDC connectors. That said, I find that crimping with a cheap tool is frustrating, so I prefer to use solder terminals, which is what we'll look at next. And here's the Amiga CGA adapter in action. It's a little known fact that all Amigas can output 16 color TTL RGB. The implementation is a little funky, but it was a useful inclusion for those who already owned a CGA monitor at the time. All right, let's take a look at how I built this custom adapter. It's an RGB cable, which is kind of the most common thing I've had to make over the years. This one in particular connects 9-pin TTL RGB to the Multisync 3D's built-in HD15 input. Here are the parts we'll be using, starting with that cut-up Belkin VGA extension cable with a female end. First, we need to measure how much of the insulation to remove, leaving enough for the strain relief, which will clamp onto it here. I'll remove roughly this much of the jacket and use my fingers as a reference. It doesn't have to be exact. Next, I'll use strippers to remove the outer insulation. Be careful not to cut too deep or you could score, or worse, sever some of the wires inside.
Now I'll use this stripping tool to expose only as much wire as I'll need to solder them to the connector. Removing too much insulation could result in a short between the wires inside your connector. I like this tool because it allows you to strip multiple wires in a single shot as long as you line them up carefully. Now we need to tone out each of the pins from the VGA connector to determine which wire goes to which pin. I'll record the wire color on the appropriate line of the reference chart that I made earlier. And there we go. All nine of the pins we care about have been identified. That leaves six wires in the cable that we won't be using. I like to trim off the unneeded wires since I'll just get in the way later when we're soldering. You don't have to do this, but if you do, make sure not to accidentally cut the wrong wire or nick another one in the process. If you do, you'll have to go back to step one for shame. Now I'll set up the parts for soldering. This IC holder is great, even for small jobs like this. These helping hands on the other hand are janky as heck. They get the job done, but they're cheap and there are better options out there. Pre-tinning the wires makes the soldering job easy later on. This is also your chance to make sure there are no loose strands wandering off from their buddies. Keeping everything together will avoid shorts later. The same goes for the connector. Pre-tinning the terminals makes the job a cinch. The solder cups on the bottom row face down, so you'll have to rotate the connector 180 degrees to access them. If you're not paying attention, you could easily lose track of which pin is which and solder your wires in the wrong place. The moment of truth. Refer to your chart and solder each colored wire to the correct pin. Use tweezers to manipulate the wires carefully and avoid burning your fingers. Make sure the exposed parts aren't touching anything they shouldn't be. And most importantly, check and double check that you're soldering to the correct pin. Many cables carry voltage on specific pins and if you get that wrong, you could damage your equipment. Don't forget to attach the ground wire to the shell of the connector. It's the one without any insulation. I didn't mention this earlier, but I cut it a little longer than the rest to make it easier to reach. And there we go, one DE9 connector all soldered up and ready for action. Hold up, not so fast. One final safety check before we button everything up to avoid any unwanted surprises. It's cheap insurance to double check that every pin is properly connected according to our chart. Even more so if there's a wire carrying five or 12 volts in your cable. Now for the outer shell and strain relief. We've got a good fitment here and plenty of insulation to grab onto. Place half of the strain relief on the cable where it belongs and hold it in place when you lift the cable out. Put the other half in place, then screw them in loosely. Reinstall the cable in the shell and make any adjustments before tightening the screws fully. Finally, the outer shell. You can place the two jack screws now or try to sneak them in later when the shell is assembled. Yeah, that's really what they're called. I didn't know either. Anyway, either method works and I've used both in the past. All that's left now is to secure the two halves of the shell together and we're done. That's a nice looking adapter that is. All right, let's see how this thing works. Spoiler alert, I already tested it on a Tandy 1000 in the last episode. I don't have an EGA machine to test with, so how about we hook it up to the Commodore 128 and give the VDC a workout? Final thoughts. There's a vast number of cable and connector types and multiple ways to build them. I've only showed you the ones I've personally had experience with and the techniques that work, or in some cases, don't work for me. I'm sure to have missed something important, so if you have any tips or tricks you want to share, let us know in the comments. Maybe this little tutorial will inspire some of you to try your hand at making your own custom cable. After all, with a little practice, it's easy. 
All right, so I hope that was helpful to you. If it was, you know what to do. Many of the parts and tools I showed are available on the RetroBits Amazon store. A link is in the description. I hope you enjoyed this bit. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on RetroBits. <laughs>